Good evening, everybody, to the April 7th, 2021 School Building Committee Forum. My name is Mark Breen. I'm a member of the School Committee and the Chairman of the School Building Committee. And uh, I'm going to make some introductory remarks, and then we'll be on our way. So we have an agenda here. Probably the most important part for many of you is the question and answer session. And if we could just, uh, you know, a couple of uh, ground rules or expectations to make it a little bit easier. If you want to submit a written question at the bottom of your screen, you can scroll to the Q&A or the chat. If you submit a question through the Q&A, that would be a little bit more, a little bit easier for us to navigate. Although if you put something in the chat, we'll figure that out as well. And there will certainly be time in the end for people to uh, raise their hand and speak, speak live at the meetings. So if you could, again, the Q&A or wait until the end, that's, that's the largest portion of our agenda. So we're going to introduce the team, the background of the whole process. And I think many people are interested in the decision-making process in terms of the site of the school, uh, and perhaps people are interested in the in the cost data as well. So those things in particular, the the uh, siting decision, the timeline, and the cost the cost decision are perhaps uh, the most important. Aside from again tonight is the Q and A that we're that we're most interested in. I think so. Next slide, please, Brian. So, you know, there are some names and faces here. Hopefully you could put names with the faces. A number of people from the Walpole Public Schools, myself, some members of the school committee, Dr. Goff, Mr. Hahn, Mr. Frischer, Mr. Connor, a number of people from the town side of government, uh, including members of the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, and, uh, and Town Hall Administrator, Jim Johnson, the Assistant Administrator, Patrick Shield, Mr. Anderson from the building, the building superintendent, and several members of the School Building Committee, and we have members of the public here, Katya Santiago Taylor and Boris Stenick, and not to be forgotten are the members of the Compass, Compass Project, Project Management Team and Tapai Architects who are here with us tonight. I'm not certain that David Steven from New Vista Design is with us, uh, but Compass and Tape will be taking much of the lead on this presentation tonight. Next slide, please, Brian. So this will be my last portion of, of the presentation. A little bit of a timeline here. Uh, so it's been a number of years that, that there's been talk of this project. It was first brought up in the 2013 McGuire report that looked at the facilities across the town. Um, and there was much discussion back then. I remember as a town meeting member and, and, uh, and you know just as a parent discussion about potentially doing something with the middle schools. And by 2018, after a couple of efforts, we were accepted into the Massachusetts School Building Authority's uh, program, where they will reimburse us for a certain portion of the costs for a school construction project that they deem to be sort of worthy and necessary. So the, the MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, has approved Walpole or had approved Walpole to consider either doing something with the bird school or doing something with a combined middle school. Um, and the town of Walpole probed, approved $1.5 million to fund going forward with, with examining this project. Uh, and we have since moved forward with the decision to uh, put a new combined middle school on the site of the bird middle school. So I think, I think those are my final remarks. I think from here, I turn it over to Dr. Goff. Am I correct, Dr. Goff? No, it'll um, be Brian Jarvis. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Jarvis, if you could, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Jarvis, Project Director from Compass Project Management. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I think we have a good turnout, so it's good. Hopefully, get people um, some updates that have maybe been on some of these forums in the past. And for those that are just um, tuning in, uh, perhaps get caught up on where we are in the project. Thanks, Mark, for that quick uh, snapshot of how far the town has come over the last few years. And what does the timeline look like for this project generally moving forward? Um, right now, as Mark mentioned, we're, with, we're working with the Mass School Building Authority, the MSBA. We are in the feasibility and schematic design phase. Uh, that's what town meeting appropriated funds for back in 2018, basically $1.5 million to get us through a schematic design and get us into a town meeting and a town vote uh, this fall. Um, so we finished up the feasibility study where we looked at a bunch of different possible concepts, different options, narrowed that down to one uh, preferred schematic, which we'll learn more about tonight, and then submitted that all into the MSBA by the end of February. 
Uh, we started that process about last September. Um, we're currently in schematic design phase where we'll, we'll put together a schematic scope, budget, and schedule. Uh, that is due to the MSBA this July, and the MSBA will have a board meeting at the end of August, at which time uh, they will vote to approve the Walpole project to move forward. Um, if that happens at the end of August, uh, they will lock in the project scope, budget, reimbursement percentage, and schedule, and the MSBA funding associated with it. And that is the information that will be brought forward to town meeting this fall, which is currently scheduled for October 18th, followed shortly thereafter by a town ballot uh, to approve the funding uh, and to approve the project. Um, assuming that the project is to get approved, um, the town would then move into the design phase and bidding phase uh, with the MSBA, which will last approximately a year. Uh, there'll be a budget associated with the design phase of the project, um, at which time we would uh, go out to a bidding phase or, or procure a contractor, possibly to start construction in late uh, 2022 uh, for approximately two year construction time period. Uh, the goal would be to finish sometime in the summer of 2024 to open school for that uh, coming school year. So it is, it is quite a long process. The MSBA has a, has a very good process around building schools. They are very deliberate. It's very detailed. Um, I think the district has already spent two years just to get to the start of the feasibility study. We've already been in this, in, in this process for a year. Uh, so it's been about three or four years since the district was approved uh, to enter the process. Um, but it is, a, it is a good process. Uh, they use it all over the state with a lot of different communities. You might be familiar with some of the other school projects in the area. Just a quick bar chart to kind of give you a visual of what that looks like. Uh, we were brought on board at the beginning of last year. Cafe Architects was procured uh, last summer. Uh, we started working immediately with the district doing some uh, educational visioning and educational programming exercises to kind of come up with an idea of what a school might look like, whether it was a single school or combined school. All of the options that possibly could have came of that were submitted to the MSBA in November. The building committee then worked to narrow those options down uh, to preferred option, which is the PSR, this preferred schematic report. That went at the end, end of February, and we're currently leading up to a schematic design report, which is due the beginning of July, at which time the MSBA will review all of that information and then vote to approve that at their board meeting um, in, in August. So between July and August is where the town will, will meet with the MSBA, negotiate all of those final numbers and schedules and, and budgets. Um, get that approved in August, and that's what's presented at town meeting. And here, here you can see the rest of the timeline playing out over the next few years. And again, this is very, very preliminary at this point. A lot of details to be filled in, but in general, this is the is this is the timeline. A couple more details quickly. Uh, these two deliverables have already gone into the MSBA. The preliminary design program, which was the first deliverable that went in November, was really looking at the existing schools, the existing sites. Uh, looking at all the possible concepts that could have came out of a, a single or a double enrollment. No decisions were made, just all the potential options were sent into the MSBA. Uh, some of the background information associated with those options, some preliminary cost estimates, et cetera, went at the end of November. We got review comments back in December and, and answered those questions at the beginning of January. The next deliverable was the PSR, Prophetic, Preferred Schematic Report which I previously mentioned, which is where the building committee and the district shortlisted and then narrowed those, all of those options down to a preferred schematic or one option, which we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, we started to put together some conceptual floor plans, a site plan and a conceptual total project budget uh, for the MSBA. And that went into the end of February and we received those comments back at the beginning of, at the beginning of March. The next main deliverable, which is due in July is, is a schematic design. Uh, these are these are design steps basically that happen on any type of construction project or any type of building project. The schematic design is roughly 30% of a design. Um, it's at just the very base level of design. There's not a lot of detail, but you start to determine site plan, uh, site traffic, floor plans, what the systems in the building might look like, code requirements, sustainability factors, uh, those type of things all get put into that schematic design package. Uh, the key here, though, is at, in the MSBA process is that uh, the MSBA bases the entire project uh, on the schematic design estimate and budget that's that comes out of this phase. So when we turn this in in July, that is when we start the ne final negotiations with the MSBA as far as uh, what the project budget's going to be, what's going to be in the project as far as scope, uh, the reimbursement rate from the MSBA, and what an estimated maximum facilities grant might look like. And we'll talk a little bit that more about that later. Uh, but they make us put uh, put all that together, and they. Um, sign a budget a scope and budget agreement, which will happen before their August board meeting. 
And that's the information that goes forward to town meeting. So you're not going to go to town meeting on an MSBA project with a bid in hand and actually know what construction numbers are. You're going to go with an agreed upon budget. A lot of work goes into this to get to a, get to a point uh, to get that number to get those numbers together. But that's a key key thing to note is that uh, you go to town meeting with a, an estimate based upon schematic design. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Goff. Thanks, Brian. Um, for those of you that may not know me, in case um, you don't have uh, children in the school system, I'm Bridget Goff, uh, superintendent of the Walpole Public Schools. And before that, uh, before I was assistant superintendent, I was actually um, the principal at Bird Middle School and um, have been at Bird Middle School for um, I think almost uh, 25 years as a teacher assistant principal and principal and um, actually before that a student. So I'm also a client and uh, no, no bird in, inside and out. So th this slide uh, shows how we arrived at, at what's known as the B1 option. That's the new consolidated middle school located at the current bird middle school um, as Mark Breen had mentioned. The MSBA required exploration of seven solution scenarios the existing Bird and Johnson sites were deemed the only viable option um, by the town. And um, what you see here, the options were to um, solely focus on Bird, and you have that uh, reno and add reno in a new building, and then the four consolidated options on the right that are highlighted in orange. Um, there were 19 conceptual options from the uh, seven solution scenarios. And I just also want to mention as, as part of the deliverables, um, people might ask, you know, how did you come up with this number of 450 or how did you come up with 905 consolidated? Well, we, we have to submit an MSB enrollment projection application. And that includes data that's reported by the district as well as data provided by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and then the school department works in conjunction with town administration. So it's really a comprehensive report that includes that included the past 10 years of enrollment, um, building permits, uh, past and projected residential developments, um, anything from housing sales to collaboratives to births, baseline projections, private schools. And then as a result, the MSBA is the one they provide us with an enrollment projection of um, 450 for one school and nine, uh, 905 for two. Next slide, please. Um, so in December, um, the school committee voted to pursue a, a combined middle school enrollment. And that was after several months of discussion. Um, there were prior forums, and I know that you see this as community um, you know, uh, forum number four, and wondering what, you know, where did the, the other three, where did they come from? Well, those prior forums are coordinated, were coordinated through the school district's distribution channels um, as the con that content dealt mostly with the educational aspects of the project. So this slide is really the rationale um, of a combined um, middle school. And this is also outlined in, in greater detail in the education program. And you can uh, able to access that on the website. It's, it's pretty comprehensive. It's about 65, 75 pages. And what that does is it establishes this comprehensive and thoughtful um, ed program that articulates our educational goals and needs of the district. And it also helps us to provide for future flexibility. So we're able to adapt to any changes of programming, any changes of teaching methodology over the useful life of the school and any potential adjustments that um, the district could realize with this proposed project. So when we look at uh, the rationale for consolidated uh, middle school, all students benefit immediately from a combined middle school project. And that's what we call equitable access. So each student receives the resources and the educational opportunities to really learn and thrive. So you have all students um, that are benefiting from the resources, our general education and our special education program. Also, um, our teaming structure and program really aligns more efficiently to the combined model. So, for example, um, since teaming is at the heart of the middle schools, you have programming really need to be um, delivered within a grade level academic teams. So in the current model, some students now that we, we call them that they're cross teamed and that really contradicts the middle school philosophy. And in order for our students to feel the sense of belonging, both academically, social, emotionally, you need to have these clearly defined and consistent teams that a combined middle school allows us to create. 
You also have a, a model. This model provides more opportunities for programming, scheduling, flexibility, and student engagement. So we know that our middle schools are committed to providing educational experiences, for example, with students with disabilities in what we call the least restrictive environment. And when we have all of our middle school and district programs in one building, that really maximizes the service and great, gives us greater flexibility uh, to deliver these services and provides a sense of, of engagement and community. And right now, some students leave their, their home neighborhoods to go across town to different schools. Now we have one neighborhood, one school, one community. Um, a combined middle school also allows us to utilize our staff in a more robust manner in terms of related arts curriculum and after school programs that couldn't be run during enrollment. And then finally, at the bottom, if you just go up a little bit, um, Brian, a combined school is significantly more cost effective than um, building separate projects. Uh, if it's separate, you're looking at well beyond 10 years to complete a, a separate project. Next slide. So with the consolidated middle school, all single school options, as you can see, are eliminated here. It's narrowed down to three. And out of those three, there are six conceptual options that were evaluated. Next slide. In terms of evaluation criteria and research, um, we evaluated the six conceptual options um, against this 12 criteria. So you can see that here. The range is anything for how well it supports the educational program and our goals to cost to the impact of the existing school during construction, athletic fields, traffic, our um, natural environment, and our long uh, range town planning and future growth. Next slide. So after the um, evaluation of the several options, the option of B1 was ultimately selected by the Walpole School Building Committee. Option B1, uh, as we mentioned, is the new consolidated middle school located between the existing Bird Middle School and Washington Street. And um, Chris Blessing from Tepe will talk more about, and you'll be able to see some um, designs in a minute. Next slide. So the B1 option best completes our vision and meets our education program. Uh, we have a district strategic plan um, that's comprised of uh, well over 60 educators, students, town officials, and community members that, co that contribute to our strategic plan. And um, the heart of it and looking at our vision and our goals um, is really inherent in teaming, collaboration, inclusion, equitable access, diversity, and community. And teaming is really at the center of um, our middle school philosophy. Next slide, please. So this slide shows how our education program supports this B1 model, and I'll keep referring it to it as the B1 model. So first, grade, our organization of grade level neighborhoods. Neighborhoods um, were indicated at least 80 times in the ed program, which came from our visioning sessions and community forums, and teaming was mentioned 140 times in the ed plan. So you can see that um, Walpole Middle Schools are really committed to educating students in an inclusive environment and values teaming. It's really important that we have a sensitive understanding of the middle school neighborhood, promoting this environment where our students, our parents, um, our community members can come together in this environment of enthusiasm, social exchange, academic excellence. So the neighborhoods equate to the building geography and really drive our core academic spaces. They're organized by three grade level teams and support the school's team-based approach to curriculum del delivery. We have these variety of flexible spaces. Our special education programs are an inherent part of each neighborhood. And these neighborhoods will contain four general education classrooms, a dedicated science classroom. We have a STEAM space, which is known as science, technology, engineering, and math to facilitate project-based learning and collaboration. So we look at these five classrooms per team and that really drives why B1 does a great job of accommodating our vision. These neighborhoods should have a feeling of home and that they're sending a message to students that they're safe and they're part of the small learning community, which in turn is connected to the fabric of a larger school. I know I mentioned earlier equitable access in the B1 model, each student's receiving the resources and educational opportunities to learn and thrive. 
We, we're looking at a technology literacy and computer science lab, a multimedia and video production lab studio. We have uh, both middle schools have robust uh, school news teams, also robotics teams, and both of those feed into um, our high school. The B1 model also maximizes greater flexibility with regard to the delivery of our special education services and really provides this expanded sense of community and builds a stronger learning environment. Um, in terms of performance and enrichment, a dedicated auditorium uh, enables us to uh, accommodate a large music program. Every single student in our middle school takes a music, whether it be band, chorus, orchestra, or general music. And one of these courses will take place um, on the stage of the auditorium. Both middle schools have a robust drama program. And we have community-based performing arts groups um, that use our auditoriums. In terms of the gym, taking two middle school gyms, creating one larger gym, and also having a teaching station that's, spared, uh, that's shared excuse me, with our special education programs. And that way we can meet all of our students' needs and allow them peer and allow everybody peer integration. In terms of the calf and the kitchen, the dining space as well as the kitchen will facilitate community outreach. So we're accommodating off our school and community education and partnerships. Um, finally, the central kitchen and the cafeteria is utilized to provide vocational opportunities um, for our students. And this space also supports job training and hands-on learning for our special education students. This partnership is an integral part of our inclusion program. In terms of outdoor learning, um, this can be used beyond recreational use and provides um, project space and social space, classrooms, and support areas of educational uh, enrichment in the environment. And it enables our students to really engage in this meaningful and exciting projects that improve our communities. And it's really important to have that indoor outdoor connection and we can hold classes and also performances for families and our community. And then finally, the visioning sessions, they express a really strong desire to build a school that allows for community access. And B1 does a great job of providing performance venues, gathering spaces, athletic spaces that can be safely accessed by the community after school, on the weekends and during summer months. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Chris Blesson uh, from Tape Architects. Good evening, um, thank you, Dr. Job. Um, one of the things that we like to look at early on in schematic design is what the envisioned character of the spaces are, both interior and exterior. And this slide is just really kind of hitting on a few of the guiding principles in those, um, in those areas. And um, really what we're looking for is a lot of natural daylight and uh, views and spaces that are sized appropriately to handle the education program that um, Dr. Goff just went over. And uh, one of the things that we found through research and um, just from doing middle schools is that connectivity is really important in middle schools um, where you can have visual connections between spaces. Some of these um, images highlight that, but um, we often look for that and other opportunities with environmental graphics to just reinforce identity and community and um, things like that. So making a school space that functions, highly functions as a school, but also um, builds community is, is one of our goals. Uh, we wanna build flexibility into every space. Uh, we wanna make sure that the teachers and administrators have the ability to quickly change modalities and other and other things on how they're teaching and learning without special tools or without the need of maintenance staff to help them do that. And uh, we also want to look for biophilia. Biophilia is just a fancy word for um, just kind of having nature or things that mimic nature or reference nature inside the building. So it's not just an, um, a manufactured environment, but it's something that uh, can help students um, connect to the natural environment. And that could be as simple as warm wood tones and things like that, which you see in some of these images as well. Um, and we want to make sure that the building is universal. And that just is another way of talking about um, universal design. So it's, it's equitable for all users, regardless of ability. Um, it's simple. 
and it's ample and understandable. So you can go to the next slide. Um, we carry a lot of those uh, uh, character and envision out to the outdoors too. Um, this was talked about just previously, but outdoor spaces, uh, we wanna make sure we have lots of opportunity. Um, we wanna have uh, easy to find access points for the school, but also a variety of types and locations. We wanna make sure that uh, you can do different things outside and different special spots for those things. Um, we, we really work hard to make sure that the stuff uh, around the building is natural and local so that it reduces the maintenance cost and it uh, helps it become more sustainable. Um, you know, for instance, we don't want to plant palm trees in the middle of Walpole probably. So um, then also on the site, we want to make sure that there's clear approach into and out of the building and that it creates some sense of scale and shelter um, and, and just warm spaces that people wanna be in. And those are some of the other images you see there. And you go to the next slide. Um, so part of the site plan development has been thinking about these connections and these envisioned characters. And what you see here is a site plan that we're working from um, it's still being, you know, we're in the early stages of schematic design right now. And so this is um, being developed and, and still being engineered and designed. And so right now what we're thinking is a lot of what you see here. Um, and you can see the building, the B1 option laid out there. And, uh, and I can't find, oh, there's the north arrow. Um, Brian, I don't know if you can highlight the north arrow so people kind of get there. Um, their orientation that the building is um, optimally sited on the sites for uh, solar orientation so that we can take advantage of the north-south axis and not um, be um, have the building systems challenged with east-west windows as much as um, uh, so solarly and sustainably it's, it's uh, optimally sited. And then we also have the outdoor learning spaces. There's um, actually three different varieties of those. There's two outdoor learning um, classrooms is what I call them. Um, and then there's uh, actually, I guess there's three, but uh, there's three of those. And then there's a school garden. We wanna make sure we have opportunities for um, students to grow things and you know really hands-on. That's actually right outside of a technology lab that could become um, sort of Indoor, outdoor, you could do hydroponics inside of a technology lab in the building or actually grow things outside as well. Um, and then on the north side of the building, we have um, some outdoor seating for the cafe. So if it's a warm, nice day, students can go outside to eat lunch. Or um, there's also an amphitheater out there. So you could have performances and things um, up on the north side of the building. And then the building is facing to the west, which is where the fields currently are, the softball field and the two baseball fields. And on the site plan, we're really trying to make an effort to connect this building across to that um, with some landscaping elements that um, take advantage of both the topography, um, so the way the grading and shape of the land, but also integrate the roadways and traffic into the site without the building feeling as though it's in the middle of a um, giant sea of parking like you would see at a mall or something like that. We want to make make the building a little bit more inviting and, and soft in, in some of the landscape. And go to the next slide. So diving a little bit deeper into the floor plans, the, the building is three stories and the um, they you can see there it's first floor, second floor, third floor from left to right um, respectively. And the first floor has on the the north end of the building, there's what we we call that the community entrance. And Dr. Goff kind of mentioned this earlier that there was this notion in the visioning session, a very strong notion for community access. And so we've we've sort of separated some of the community use parts of the building, so the cafeteria, auditorium, and gym, into um, the north end of the building, which can be sectioned off and closed. Um, for the rest of the building after hours or on the weekends. So if you provide access for the community, it's only a certain portion of the building and not the entire thing. Um, and so that north part has those big, those big picture elements. And then the blue color is the band and course. So that's performing arts. And, um, and then 
the bottom portion, the southern portion of the building that um, has the three wings coming off of it actually are the three distinct learning neighborhoods that Dr. Goff talked about that have the three teams for um, middle school, which directly follows the education program and really the best kind of what we see as best practices for middle school learning, teaching and learning. Um, these three wings are identical on all three floors, and it really provides a lot of flexibility for um, the district. You know, right now there's a certain way that we do school, but in the future there may be some other way of doing it, and this provides flexibility for the district to ebb and flow with their thinking on education and um, and think through different modalities of, of learning and arranging school. So um, I won't get too much into that, but right now it's teamed. And um, I think the, the thought process right now is that it might end up being sixth, seventh and eighth grade on individual floors. And, um, but there's other ways you can do it as well. Um, I wanna take a second to highlight the orange blocks, which are the special um, education components. And um, there's, there's a lot of effort gone into trying to equally disperse those into the, the building and um, not have them end up at one end or the other. And, um, and so the idea is to try to integrate the special education components into the community and life of the school as much as we can. Um, and then the other component to mention is the media center and library, which is on the second floor with the gym um, up on the north end of the building. You can go to the next slide. So zooming back out again quickly, you see the site plan here. Um, the, the current thinking, and, and we're still analyzing and, and developing with, we've had some recent comments that were um, thinking through about some of the traffic items. Um, and we do have traffic studies and traffic reports. Um, so that's an ongoing conversation and an ongoing engineering um, uh, item for us. But the thinking going into preferred schematic was that we would enter with cars off of Washington Street, which is the way that it currently operates. And um, cars would come down the long driveway and then make a right-hand turn um, in front of the school and then have a drop-off and then turn back and go towards Washington Street. And then Washington Street would be, uh, the exit would be made better with um, actually two lanes, a left turn lane and a right turn lane, which could help ease the traffic concerns. And there's a bit of a longer queuing possibility on this site with the increased traffic from two populations of middle school, the 905 students. Um, one of the key things that helps with traffic flow on the site, and this is where this early preferred schematic layout came from, is having a separate bus entry. And so the notion here is that separating buses and cars is safer for everybody, but also um, freeze up that moment when the buses all get there. They don't have to wait in line, that big long line of cars. But then when the buses park and open their doors and have the flashers come out and the stop sign come out, it basically grinds the entire site circulation to a screeching halt. And nothing can happen until those doors are closed and traffic is reopened. Um, but by separating the buses and the cars, you eliminate that issue and you also create separate safe access for buses and cars. And it also provides us um, a secondary entry point for service vehicles um, to reach the uh, service area for the school, which um, as noted before, there's a centralized kitchen. So there's vans that come here to get the lunches and take them to the other schools. And so that provides an easy access point there without having to take up the main entry road for cars and, um, and um, visitors. So, um, so like I said, there's a, a road also going as Brian is highlighting with this cursor there, there's a road access road going around the building for emergency vehicles. Um, and that would again only be for emergency access, but it provides that safe access for um, first responders. Um, and again, this is a zoomed out view and um, a really, um, it, it's a preferred schematic view, but it, we're still studying ways to make this better with um, recently published um, traffic reports and studies. So 
You go to the next slide. And then in the preferred schematic, we also included a massing diagram. One of so one of the notions actually during preferred schematic was a, a question of whether or not to build four stories on the site or three. And three stories actually works better for the educational program, but as a byproduct, it also works better for the massing on the site. Um, the the place where we're putting the building is slightly elevated up from the fields, um, but it's lower than Washington Street, <laughs> so it's sort of right in the middle. Um, but and if we were to put a four-story building there, it would most definitely be taller than a lot of the trees that are in the area in the neighborhood. The three-story building is actually um, lower or at about the same height as a lot of the mature trees that are on the property edge and on the abutters properties. And so it helps to blend in the building. And, and like I said, with the envisioned character earlier, we're going to try to work really hard to manage the scale and um, size and appearance of the building so that it still fits within its local um, setting. And so this mapping diagram just helps kind of show um, what the new school might might look like um, in the place that it's proposed. Um, so I think, uh, that's all for me. All right, thanks, Chris. All right, so I'll go through some of the numbers related to the project. So preferred schematic square footage. So where are we? So the option B1, the building size is approximately 161,900 square feet, so just under 162,000. Uh, as part of the process with the MSBA, we're always comparing the size of the building, the number of spaces, the size of spaces uh, to the MSBA guidelines for middle schools. So they have guidelines for elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. Uh, they base the reimbursement on those guidelines. Uh, and we're trying to get as close to those guidelines as possible without sacrificing Walpole's educational program or vision or some of the amenities that they want to have in the building, uh, like an auditorium. Uh, so we worked really hard to get the building size down to 161. We're approximately 17,000 gross square feet over the MSBA's guidelines um, of 144. And the biggest driving factor of that is the MSBA does not recognize an auditorium as part of a middle school curriculum. So they, they recognize a cafetorium, which if you've been to Bird, uh, you understand what that is. That's basically a cafeteria with a stage on one end. Um, they do not recognize a full auditorium as part of a middle school. They recognize it for high school, uh, but a lot of communities have robust musical and performing arts programs and they want to have an auditorium to support those as well as other community functions like town meeting and things that the community might do as extra curricular activities. So the 161,000 square feet includes a full auditorium and that's really the the basis for the difference between the Walpole uh, option B1 and, and the MSP guidelines. Um, another point of comparison is how do you compare that to other projects that other communities have done and the way to kind of do apples to apples is to look at square footage per student. So you take the size of the building and divide that by the enrollment. And these are all the middle schools that have gone through the MSBA projects, the MSBA process over the years for large enrollments, so over 800 students. Um, they've done middle, some middle schools smaller, a lot of, a lot of schools out west um, are smaller enrollments. There are some that are in the 700s, but these are for the ones that are over 800, uh, which is what Walpole will be at 905. Um, so you take the school, the, the community, the enrollment of the students and the size of those buildings, and it comes up with a square foot per student. Uh, the average of all these larger ones is, is 171. And that, that takes into account some schools did an auditorium, some, some schools did not. Uh, Walpole currently at option B1 for a 905 students is 179 square feet per student. Uh, so slightly above average, but two schools that you might be familiar with, uh, the Natick Kennedy Middle School, which is open this uh, January, and the Braintree South Middle School, both large, large enrollment, large schools are 182 square feet per student. So Walpole's in line uh, with some of its neighbors and uh, surrounding communities. Over the last few months before submitting the preferred schematic, uh, the, the project team, the district, the town was very cognizant that square footage drives project cost. Um, and the goal is to, to not build something that's overdone. Basically, you know, what you need and, and, not, and nothing, nothing less and nothing more. Um, when we put the educational plan and program together for the first time into a floor, floor plan at the PDP stage, when we came up with those 19 options, we had over 173,000 square feet. We had roughly 192 square feet per student. So if you remember that on the previous slide, the average was 171. Natick and uh, Braintree were at 182. 
And we kept working those options down with what was really necessary. How could we maximize the efficiency of this building, still getting the program that we wanted, but driving that square footage down to come up with a project that was more cost effective uh, for the community. Um, we finally settled on the current option of B1, uh, which includes classrooms within, within the MSBA guidelines. It includes a central kitchen, but we're offsetting uh, some of that square footage with the way we're able to rearrange the cafeteria. Uh, so we don't, we don't go over the MSBA guidelines. We did include the third gym space, as Dr. Goff mentioned. It's very important when we're combining the two middle schools to have a third teaching station, not only for uh, gym classes, but also to support some of the special ed education programs and alternative gym programming. And it does include a 600 seat auditorium, which we thought was vital for the performing arts educational program, as well as um, the music and the band, the chorus, and a lot of the extracurricular and community activities. Uh, the only way to really get the building smaller would be to go with the cafetorium option, basically taking out that square footage uh, that we mentioned was really the driving difference between uh, where the building is now and what the MSBA guidelines were. Hey, Brian, can I, can I just make a note that third gym space doesn't mean three gyms? I just Correct. Yep. That it's, yeah, it's third, so the gym, third gym space is really a third gym teaching space. It's not a full-sized gym with the, with the higher ceiling, so to speak. So it's not like you have a third full-size basketball court, but you do have a third gym space to host another class, to host an alternative gym class. Um, basically get three teaching stations while the big gym that you'd be familiar with would be split into two teaching stations and this provides a third space. Um, we did receive, and this is one of the areas where potentially the MSBA could come back and say, hey, you're over our square footage guidelines. We won't support this. We're not going to find this to be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, we submitted this as part of our preferred schematic report, um, backed up with the with arguments for it in the educational program. And the response we got back from the MSBA is they are, keep, they are considering this to be an eligible space uh, as required by the educational program. So that was some good news coming back uh, at the beginning of March. But this can show this can show you, shows you some of the work that's gone on with the project team, you know, being cognizant of the biggest driver of, of cost at this stage is square footage and trying to get that building as efficient as possible. When you plug that square footage in uh, to estimated costs, um, we did an estimate at the end of PDP. We also did an updated estimate on the preferred schematic at the end of PSR this past February, uh, professionally estimated. Um, construction costs are roughly $543 dollars per square foot. That includes the new building. It also includes any abatement or anything that might need to happen at the old building prior to demolition of bird and includes the demolition of bird and it includes the site work. Uh, it's some of those site uh, drawings that we looked at previously. Um, that square footage at that cost is roughly $88 million in construction. At this stage at a preliminary budget, we're carrying approximately 25% of that construction cost in soft costs. And that goes for OPM project management, the designer fees, administration fees and, and costs during the project, basically anything the town might need to do as part of the project, the furniture and equipment that might go into the new school and any of the technology that the, that the district might buy as part of the new school goes into that soft cost. And all of these costs have yet to be determined. Um, if, the, if the project is approved at town meeting, then we uh, formalize contracts for project manager, the designer, start to get uh, bidding and quotes for these types of items, but we go into it with, with an overall budget. We also put in contingencies for the project, and those are, again, based upon percentage of that construction cost, 88 million. We, we add 5% of that 88 million for construction costs, so those are things that might come up during a construction project. Change orders, that's what that's for. We also put another 2.5% for soft costs, so things that might come up during the project for soft costs related to the OPM or the designer or maybe just some additional furniture needs to be procured or uh, permitting fees or something that wasn't um, you know thought of initially pops up there is a percentage there is a percentage contingency for that of roughly six million when you put that all together at this early stage the estimated total project cost is uh, under 120 million at 116 million so how does that work with the partnership with the MSBA um, and I know there's a lot of information out there about the MSBA. We, we encourage you to go to the website that they, they do a very good job of breaking down their entire process, the modules of the process. Um, and you can get a lot of information um, there. I'll try to summarize it quickly for you here. Um, so the way the MSBA reimbursement works is that the MSBA agrees to reimburse the district at a stated rate. So basically a base rate of reimbursement, a, a base percentage, plus any incentives that the project might be eligible for. And that 
And basically they'll say, they'll, they'll reimburse that stated rate of all eligible project costs. But you need to note that that does not mean overall project costs. So they're not saying we're gonna give you our base rate against your total project costs. We're gonna give you our base rate against what we deem to be eligible. And they have a whole bunch of categories and caps and things that determine if, if costs on the project are eligible or not. So not all project costs end up being eligible uh, for reimbursement from the MSBA. And it's, it's, it's not possible at this stage at the way the market is and the way things are, it's not possible to have 100% uh, reimbursement from the MSBA for a project at your base rate. The effective rate is what we like to talk about. So that's really what is a district gonna receive at the end of the day? And that's always, so that effective percentage is always less than the stated, stated percentage. Right now, the Walpole stated base percentage from the MSBA when they signed up the initial agreement uh, with Walpole is 48%. So the MSBA is saying, we're gonna, we're gonna reimburse you 48% of all costs on this project that we deem to be eligible. And what that is, is that's not all project costs, it's all the projects they deem to be eligible. We think that in the course of the project, we have a few other ways to, to increase that percentage through a couple incentives. One, is, one of it's through, um, highly efficient systems that are going to the building for another two percentage points. The district's maintenance program for how they're gonna take care of the building long-term adds another percentage point or two. So we could be up around 51 or 52% of eligible costs reimbursed. Uh, this all will be finalized after that July submission uh, prior to the MSBA board meeting this August. And that number will be final when it goes to town meeting uh, in the fall. So that, that that reimbursement percentage then turns into the, what the MSBA calls its facilities grant. That's the, basically the grant that they give the town at the, at, as part of the project reimbursement. You start with your total project costs that we just went through. You take out any ineligible construction costs per the MSBA, you take out any, any ineligible soft costs, and that leaves you with total eligible project costs. You then take that total project eligible cost, multiply it by that stated reimbursement rate, and that gives you the MSBA's estimated maximum total, total facilities grant. That's what the MSBA will reimburse the town, what they will give the town. The key to remember here is that they, they continue to audit that facilities grant all the way through the project. So as you're doing the project and submitting costs to the MSBA for audit and review, they're reviewing that to see if you're going over any of those initial assumptions on costs that were eligible, and they can actually deem things to be ineligible throughout the project. So there's most likely at the end of the job, even though they stated an estimated maximum grant, the, the hard dollars that the town gets back is gonna be less than that. So you take the total project costs of the, of the project, then you deduct whatever the MSBA is gonna give you of their, their maximum total facilities grant, and that's left with the town share of what the town will ultimately need to fund at the end of the project. The other note on this is that the MSBA actually requires the town to approve the total project cost of town meeting and ballot. So if it's a $160 million project, the town is gonna vote on a $160 million project, although they're gonna get reimbursements throughout the project back from the MSBA. And what actually ends up being funded or borrowed or however the town finances it at the end will be less than that total project cost. The MSBA wants the town to approve that total project cost of town meeting and the ballot. So that's a key point to remember. So how does that work for this current project? As we talked about, uh, current estimated total project bud budget's approximately 116 million. When you put that into the MSBA's calculator and their total, total project budget spreadsheet, uh, they come up with a basis for a maximum facilities grant meeting the eligible cost of approximately 67 million. And that's due to ineligible costs. And we can go into more detail in Q&A if you'd like. But the biggest driver is a construction cost cap. Basically the market cost of construction right now is up over 500, 600 something dollars a square foot. The MSB only reimburses up to $333 per square foot. They're not saying that you can build a building for $333. They're saying we only, we only participate in refunds up or reimbursements up to 333. Any Delta between 333 and the cost of the project is ineligible and they take that off the top and they lower that 116. And eventually we get down to the $67 million number. So they don't, that's a big driver. The auditorium, as we mentioned, is categorically ineligible. So the cost of the auditorium comes off. Any site caps that we might go over on site work, et cetera. So all projects go through this. It's just not, this is just not unique to Walpole. So then they base that total base, they, to, they base that base rate off that $67 million, not the total number. So when you put that 52% that we might get to against 67 million, that means the MSBA will reimburse Walpole approximately 35 million. Again, these numbers are all preliminary, but this is where we're at right now. Um, so at the end of the day, total project cost minus what we think we're going to see in reimbursement, 116 minus 35, 
gives you a town share of approximately $81 million. So at the end of the day, the project will cost the town approximately $81 million. And this is what we mean by the effective reimbursement rate. So the effective reimbursement rate for the project is actually about 31%, which is what we're seeing right now on uh, middle school, high school projects in the low 30s. So that's 31% of total project costs, not the 52. So that's what we mean, the difference between a base, base percentage of 52 and the actual effective rate, 31. How does that translate um, impacts to the tax taxpayer? So we the town has run this through the finance department. And this is just a straight calculation at this point. There aren't any other variables factored in, such as expiring debt or anything like this. They, uh, they pick three different borrowing scenarios. So basically a $75 million funding option, an $80 million funding option, was, which is where the current B1 option comes in. So an $81 million town share is this $80 million option or an $85 million town share. Um, so that includes the current B1 option, the auditorium, the third gym space, et cetera. It's based on a 30 year uh, level term debt, assuming a three and a half percent rate, uh, which again, that might be better when they actually go to borrow. But again, that we're trying to be conservative at this point. Um, and that's based on the current estimates at the current square foot estimates for the project. When you look at that against the average, uh, the residential value property in Walpole, uh, the average assessed value is 556. These three borrowing scenarios gives you a range of what the tax impact might be to that taxpayer, anywhere between 423 to 478. And obviously based on your assessed value uh, going up and down from there. So for the average single family assessed in Walpole, the tax impact currently Preliminary estimates of the project is roughly 400 in the 400 range uh, dollars per year. So just to wrap up and we'll get to questions, uh, just a, a quick reminder. So we're currently here uh, in April working on the preferred, uh, working on the schematic design. The goal is to get that entire package in the MSBA July and then use July to the end of August to negotiate all those numbers with the MSBA, get hard numbers for a budget um, hard numbers with reimbursement from the MSBA and then have all the information for September and October leading up to the town meeting uh, to get in front of as many community members as possible. Town vote uh, if the project is approved and then proceeding into design through uh, 22, uh, possibly starting construction by the end of end of 22 and then construction is approximately two years long. Um, one of the questions that we received is the first class that would go through that. I believe that current uh, second graders um, would be the first sixth graders in the project. Uh, first or second graders would be the first students through as sixth graders uh, if we maintain this schedule. And then just a way to stay informed and stay involved. Um, obviously those who have registered tonight, we're at the school's website that has a link to the project. Uh, we are posting all of the presentations up there. There's a list of frequently asked questions. Um, our monthly reports are up there. Uh, we try to get as much information as possible. There's also a video of the existing uh, Bird Middle School that was done uh, as a walkthrough from when we were procuring designers so you can see some of the current conditions. Um, I encourage you to visit the Mass uh, MSBA's website, Mass School Building Authority website, get more information on, on what we just talked through um, and what other towns are doing. You can see all the information about all the other projects going on with the MSBA, all the past projects that they've ever done. Um, and then we've already received a bunch of questions on the project, which is great. If you have more questions after tonight or we don't get to you, um, please send us an email at middleschoolproject.walpole.k12.ma.us. Uh, we will get back to you. Um, even if we don't have an answer, we'll get back to you, let you know that you got your email, and we'll, and we'll get back to you as soon as we have more information. And then upcoming meetings, uh, the next building committee is next uh, is that Wednesday, next Tuesday. Um, I believe those are broadcast on Walpole Media, and we post all those presentations and recordings on, on the website as well. Um, so with that, we'll stop. We ran a little bit longer than we wanted to, uh, but hopefully that answered a lot of your questions. Um, if you do want to speak, uh, we ask you to use the raise your hand icon next to your name, um, and we'll try to call on you. Uh, we are asking to keep it quick, if you can keep a question to 15, 20 seconds. And if you do have any follow-up questions, let's try to get through everybody else's first question. And if there's time left at the end, we'll, we'll come back around for follow-up questions. Uh, if you don't feel like speaking, please use the Q&A feature. They'll give us a list of all the questions. That way, if if we don't get to everyone, at least we have them in a list and we can um, get them uh, back onto a frequently asked questions list or something. Uh, so with that, I'll stop sharing. And I think Thanks, uh, Mr. Hunt. Um, yeah, Bill, did you wanna um, start with the, the Q&A at the bottom and hit those few first and then jump over to the, the people who have their hands raised? 
Um, sure. Do you want me to read each entire question? There's some that are a little longer than others or summarize? Um, either or. Okay. So the first question um, was about uh, the future of potential funding from President Joe Biden proposing a $2 trillion infrastructure plan that would provide potentially $100 billion for new school construction and upgrades to existed buildings. Um, would Walpole consider replacing Byrd and waiting for funding to take care of Johnson, thus reducing the cost to taxpayers? Or can we uh, consider holding on finalizing our financing until we comply for additional federal aid if it's available later in this year or next? And then there's that follow up question about uh, COVID relief money might be used to upgrade heating and UV ventilation and filtration costs. Um, Bridget, I don't know if you want to talk to this. I will say, though, from an MSBA's perspective, at this point, um, we really can't go back to we're just going to do a single school. Uh, I think they would, if this was the case and we decided we wanted to split the schools, um, they would basically ask us to re restart, basically make sure we're sure with what we want to do. Um, my guess is they would make us go back to the beginning. But again, um, this is a new scenario that's come up, so um, this hasn't really been broached yet. But that my my initial thought on this is, if we decided to stop on a combined school, go back to two two separate schools, the MSBA is going to make us get out of the process, confirm it, what we want to do, and start it all over again. And as you knew, for, as you saw from uh, Mr. Breen going through that timeline, currently, since exception acceptance into the program, we're three years from acceptance um, in 2018. We're six years from when he started the process. So. Um, yeah, and I just to add, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, you know, right now it's a proposal that still needs to go through, obviously, the legislative process, and you know, the details are far from certain. And, and as Brian mentioned, right now, it, you know, the funding mechanism is through MSBA, and um, also, you know, just indicating the whole issue of equitable access for all students um, to be able to, and all all the rationale and reasons as to why a combined middle school is um, much more feasible than, than to have two separate middle schools. And Nancy, will, did and you want to add something? Sorry, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to add that I don't know much. I, this is the first time I'm hearing about that, that potential source of funding. But I do know that the majority of federal funding goes to the cities that have the most need. So um, you know, not knowing the specifics, I, I, would, assu I would assume that um, if you were a Holyoke or a Brockton or a Springfield or a Boston, you'd have a much better chance than a Walpole. Um, I could be wrong. And I will just I will add to that since there was a COVID aspect to it. I know it's also a question. Um, the MSBA's reimbursement funding is locked in for Walpole. So uh, we were approved um, prior to COVID. Uh, so the way that COVID has affected the MSBA is they've actually just they've um, reduced the number of projects that they've been starting moving forward since COVID, uh, but the Walpole funding uh, was already earmarked for Walpole, so it has not been impacted by COVID. All right, great. The second question, please verify that local resident requirements will be included in the bid process for a subcontractor. Yeah, that's, some, that's something that, um, we can work with the town on. Uh, there will be requirements in the contract since we're getting state funding, uh, both for uh, minority and women business owned enterprises. Um, we already have those requirements on the design team. So the design team uh, has a substantial amount of minority and women owned businesses uh, as part of their sub consultant team. Uh, we will have that for contractors as well. Um, and then we can also um, work with local, local, um, local worker requirements also to see if there's a target that we could possibly get to. Great, next question. Will the new building be LEED certified or have a sustainable component to reduce building operating costs? Chris, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it will be, the, there's two different programs for certifying schools. One is LEED for schools. The other is the Collaborative for High Performance Schools. The MSBA recognizes both of those and when Brian mentioned earlier that there's some avenues for getting some additional percentage point reimbursement from the MSBA, um, two of those points come from building a lead building that's either lead certified uh, silver or chips verified. And our intention right now is to design the building for at a very minimum lead, lead silver. Great, thank you. 
Next question, how many students will each class be able to accommodate? You're looking at, um, Chris, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, you know, 100 students per, per neighborhood. And when you have those five classrooms and you divide it, so you're looking at 20, 21 um, per neighborhood. I get that one, Chris? That works. That, that's right. average class size. Chris, on average, how many of these students in case our enrollment were to grow, would the classrooms be able to accommodate? Yeah. Say that again, Bill. I didn't catch that. Just so I don't, we don't miss the question. That's our average class size projections. But how many, if our enrollment were to grow, would these classrooms? Be, how many students would these classrooms be able to accommodate? Beyond okay, that? right. So the MSBA has us designed for a typical classroom to hold twenty-four students. So um, three three classrooms per, or three students per classroom with thirty-six general classrooms and. Uh, nine science classrooms. That's 45. Someone can do that math real quick. <laughs> that's 135 students, right? So, um, right. ish to have the building grow without having to need to expand at all. Thank you. I think I just want to make sure we answer that question fully. Please verify a structure will be provided to screen mechanical equipment on the third story. Yes, it will be. Um, we actually do. Uh, really in-depth uh, acoustic analysis. They come and bring acoustic sensors out on the building. This is in design development, but they, they put them out on the site for, uh, I think it's a few days, and they gather acoustic data. And then the building has to be designed to be less than that baseline acoustic noise. And a lot of times that requires acoustic capabilities on the screens, but that's in some ways, the least of your worries, especially on this site where you have the building across the hill and up a little bit from East Street, um, you need a visual barrier there. But we are thinking about um, screens to hide and, and minimize the impact of those big um, systems. Bill, I think you hopped over one before that, though. Uh, okay. where, will the, uh, where will the kids be going to school while this one? is built. Um, I can start that one. They'll actually be going to school in, in the, the actual, the building, the current building it is, there is now um, as the new one's being built. Um, we're very fortunate to have Compass uh, team because they um, were involved in the Natick Middle School and um, that that's exactly what happened there and it was, um, it was extremely successful. Brian, I don't know yeah, so the, the phasing and logistics uh, plan currently is that the new building will be built, uh, the, the existing bird will remain in operation. Um, it is going to take, you know, a, a logistics plan to get that done. It is something that is very common though on school projects these days because the towns do not have a lot of land to just go build a new school someplace else. Um, TAPE and ourselves, we have a lot of experience with that. We were the project managers for the Kennedy Middle School. Um, very similar situation. It was built directly in front of um, the existing school, while that school is in, in operation, I mean, at one point we were 30 feet away uh, for a good portion of the new building. We also uh, have done this before on the high school in Marshfield. We did this at the high school in Norwood. Um, very common, um, very common approach for school projects that you build either directly in front of or directly behind of and then flip the parking or fields or something like that at the end of a project. So um, the goal is to minimize impact as much as possible, providing temporary circulation, you know, once the kids are in the building, they don't necessarily know a construction project's going on. We have very little issues in, in Natick with that. Um, and obviously Johnson will stay at Johnson until the building is done. And then once the building is complete, um, bring them all in, either staggered or together. That hasn't been quite figured out yet. Okay, I'm gonna try to combine the, these next two questions. Is there a formal get out the vote campaign in the works for the fall in advance of the town meeting? Townwide votes, and in speaking with people, I worry that there's a lack of understanding, lack of interest from people in the community. And the next question says, who should we contact if we want to help support this project? Okay. While I'm talking, maybe you can um, find if there's somebody in the in the queue that wants to speak to that, because mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, I'm not in, in school department and, and Compass. We can um, speak to this. We can educate, not advocate. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it looks like uh, something just came in the chat. Um, so if folks have, if folks can see the chat box, uh, it looks like there's some information there. Um, I can read it. It yep. says a, a group of Walpole residents are organizing 
in support of the middle school project. If you would like to get more information out, fill out this form. Maybe we can put that, I don't know if they can see it. Um, I can make a copy of that link and send it to panelists and attendees right now. That's great, thank you. Um, While you're doing that, Bill, do you want me to keep yeah, reading? I'll, I'll, I can read the next question before I do that. The new great. building seems to be used in the same footprint of the current building. How will construction work when the school's in session or will there be students or where will students go during construction? So Mr. Jarvis, you spoke a little to this. Do you want to expand a little bit more on that or do you feel like you've answered that question? Um, you can show the, show the site plan. There's another question down below that asked something similar. So I think if you show the site plan, we can talk through that again. Yeah, yeah the slide that shows the um, red dotted footprint of the existing school would be helpful because there is a later question related to size. Thought I had it. It's up in your section. Um, Can you see that? The other one is more clear, Brian, if you go up to the first site plan that you showed. Yeah, it's having trouble uh, loading for some reason. This one right here. Do you see that? Um, I, it's not in yet, but I can tell that's what it's going to be. <laughs> Uh, just by that sliver at the bottom. It's um, yeah, I know it's the right slide, it's just not loading. So do you want to go back to the other one for right now? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Sorry about that. No, I'll use my annotation to highlight it. Um, yeah, the, I, I just the other one just had a caption here that says the the old building is this red dotted line. I'm drawing right now, so uh, oh moved it. <laughs> um, okay. The existing building is right here. And so what we've done is we've positioned the building in a way that meets all the setbacks for the site and gives enough room between the building and the new construction to allow for the building to be built. Um, you can go back to one of the other building committee meetings or it may actually be on the website but we have a logistics plan that shows site access and circulation for the during construction part of this that we've thought through um, and um, being completely transparent that bus access road off to the site actually plays a pretty critical role for um for helping the construction logistics to work and not mixing construction traffic with car traffic. But um, the current thinking is what you see here. Um, the building won't move really at all, um, but the site roads and the things like that may update or tweak or change, so. Right, so there's gonna be a need for temporary drop-off loops, obviously, so kids can still get in the front front door and then temporary staff parking up where the you know um, auditorium parking is now in the grass. Uh, we had to do this at the Kennedy Middle School project. We had to build a temporary parking lot uh, for staff. And, and unfortunately, you know, construction projects, that's the way they go. You have to get creative with how you host your programs um, based on what you have availability parking wise. You know, things get scheduled off site for the two years during construction, but it's kind of how the projects need to go in order to get, get the buildings built. Okay, before you take that slide down, the next question, you might be able to use the same slide um in the event that say 10 years plus down the road walpole sees an unexpected growth in school age population what options are available for expanding the new middle school if needed so that it can grow with the community um part of the msba process is that we look at expansion opportunities now and develop a site plan around that and so um the first thing i'd like to mention is what we just talked about with the class sizes is that you already have built in um, the bubble, we already had that built in because of the average class size to the actual size of the classroom. So you have a little bit of built in additional capacity, but um, I'll draw on the screen now is that we have planned the site so that you can actually add a few classrooms to the end of each of these wings, um, probably just one or two classrooms. And if you did that times three for each floor, 
um, you're getting um, probably well above what the bubble might be in the future if there ever well classrooms right yeah but again the msba's projections are often really pretty good and reliable and um, i've not seen many districts have a problem with that well into the future so um but again that's being considered and the site plans are being developed around that notion now so that if you have to you can do that all right I leave this up or take it down? I believe you can take it down. Okay. Um, what is the plans for repurposing of the existing Johnson Middle School? Uh, the town will study that use. Um, there's not a there's not a plan yet. Uh, that's something obviously if the project gets approved, then that's something the town will look more closely at. Next question, how will you mitigate the impact of construction on the dozens of neighboring homes? Um, so typically what we've done in the past um, is we're pretty cognizant of start times. Um, there's a lot of requirements in town already through the bylaws as far as uh, allowable uh, construction activity, um, as far as start and end times for the day. Uh, typically we have noise restrictions. So we typically do a lot of monitoring uh, during construction as needed if we think there's going to be something from an earthwork perspective that might cause you know vibrations or something of that nature um, the goal of construction and the new building is basically items that are on site noises and disturbances basically stay with on site as much as possible i mean the fact is there's going to be there's going to be some noise there's going to be some backup alarms you can be able to see our goal is that is that minimize as much as possible making sure people are, are sticking to um, start and end times. They're not starting before seven o'clock in the morning, um, things like that. Um, monitoring for any disturbances that might come off site. And then the permanent building itself. I mean, everything from lighting is not supposed to go, go beyond the property line to the acoustics of equipment noise, as Chris mentioned earlier, are not supposed to be any greater than what the current background noises are. So um, we've, done, we've done a lot of projects in residential neighborhoods. Uh, we also get out in front um, of a lot of the activity on site with, um, we do basically daily updates to the staff. We do weekly updates to the school community that go home with the, the parents so they understand what's happening on a weekly basis. We, we can do community meetings on a weekly basis so they understand um, what, what might be happening from a trucking perspective, what might be happening on the site, if there's gonna be any type of disturbances to utilities or anything like that. Uh, we try to be as proactive as possible. Uh, we will have um, some type of communication mechanism, whether it's a construction email address that gets a hold of people on site, a website, um, trying to be as proactive as, as possible. So um, we've had good success in the past in a lot of tightly packed residential areas. Um, this is actually one of the more open uh, sites, if you can believe that, um, that we've worked on. So um, we're open to ideas, but we typically have a pretty good plan in place. Thank you. Next question, how will you handle appropriate air exchange in the building? Um, I, I was thinking about this question and what popped into my mind was tear down the existing bird. Um, that was, <laughs> but, um, but in, in all seriousness, the systems that we're talking about provide the utmost of like what we went through with COVID. Um, we went through a really robust analysis of what we're designing for in these current buildings and even after even like some buildings that we just finished designing and opening. And um, they, the, the system that we're thinking about right now for the uh, middle school has 100% dedicated outside fresh air that can come in and, um, and basically you can change the air as many times as you need to. It's just a matter of volume. And um, because it's 100% outside air into each classroom and not recycled air that comes like return air that goes up into some filter and then comes back into the building, the return air is 100% exhausted and energy recovered. So the heat that comes off of that is captured into an energy wheel and then put back into the incoming fresh air so that you're not recycling that used air, if you will. Um, and so there's, there's a whole lot of science around it, but um, just to tell you that the systems that you have in the Bird and, and the Johnson really are not the same systems that we're talking about now. And they, um, 
they achieve a very, very high rate of, um, of um, air, air exchange. So I, I, I didn't get too much into the scientific weeds on that, but I think um, it's one of those that the new systems just achieve the higher level of change that we are required to meet and, and above and beyond that. And I'll, and I'll add to that, um, during construction, one of the requirements for the project will be an air quality plan um, for the contractor. So during construction, that the construction doesn't impact the air quality of the existing bird. So um, we will have a plan in place for all the keeping the keeping the dust down, added filtration, exterior filtration, that type of stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, why does the auditorium only have 600 seats if the projection <clears throat> is for 900 students? Um, I'll take a I'll take a shot at it. Um, so, so it's kind of a balancing act of trying to keep square footage uh, down um, and cost down. Um, the thought is that it's 600 square feet um, that allows for basically uh, to get two classes, two grades in at once uh, to watch a performance during the day, and that and as they do now, they can schedule around those performances. Um, the other thinking was is that uh, grade uh, grade level performance would be enough to allow a student to be performing and then two, two folks from home uh, to be in the audience. We thought that was a, a pretty good compromise as far as size. Brian, I believe the capacity at the high school is approximately 500 from my last. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that number. Principal but, yeah, English, so it's a little, it's bigger than the high school. Yeah. Will all parts of the school inside and out be completely wheelchair accessible? Yes. 100 percent. Um, how long does the state allow Walpole to uh, to approve an override before withdrawing its reimbursement offer? Is this a 30 year debt exclusion or an override? So the um, from the MSBA's board approval at the end of August um, per the MSBA's procedures, we have 120 days uh, to get an approved project in town. Um, so basically, you typically try to time your project deliverables with an MSBA board meeting that doesn't happen every month. Um, and then 120 days from that board meeting until town meeting into a town ballot. So that lines up currently that if it gets approved by the MSBA in August, we line up for a town meeting in the fall with a, a vote in uh, November. So we'd be within that 120 days. Um, the follow on question to that is if, if it does not pass, at town meeting um, or at the ballot, uh, they do give the town, um, you have to notify the town within 10 days and you have, and work out a plan to think if there's a, if, if there's a way to represent that. Um, typically that does not necessarily happen because changes that it might be needed to get it to pass uh, may be too drastic, um, at which time the MSBA basically would stop the program end the program for Walpole and Walpole would basically be out of the program. And if you wanted to pursue the middle school again, you would then start over with a statement of interest and resubmit the MSBA kind of fresh and go through that process again. And as I mentioned, we're, we're three years from acceptance of the statement of interest currently. And I think the second question, debt exclusion, I believe this is technically a debt exclusion. Okay, thank you. This next question, I don't believe you'll be able to answer now, but something either you can provide where this information can be found or we can get um, back if someone wants to send us an email with a contact because this is an anonymous attendee sent this. Please provide a cost analysis breakdown of items, including rebates for the following uh, photovoltaic, if I pronounce that right, lighting controls and building management systems. Yeah, so, so there are a lot of programs um, that the project can be a part of and it's kind of a combination of um, what the district or town wants to be involved in. Um, we have done that on a lot of projects where especially uh, different utility providers like Eversource, for example, have a lot of programs in place, uh, rebate programs, incentives um, for using things like LED lighting, high efficiency systems. Um, you can get rebates, you know, different differing amounts depending on the project. So that is something that will be part of this project. Um, Rebates related to solar will really be a larger town decision, uh, decision or district decision. The building will be solar ready. Uh, currently, right now, there's not there's not a plan to have actual solar panels be included in the project in the construction project. 
but the building will be ready to accept solar and that's a decision the town is we haven't had those um in depth conversations yet on the project so some of those details are still being worked out but there are a lot of incentives out there uh, related to those items um but we will um we'll be getting that getting to those in the next in the next few months okay what does minimum lead silver design include solar panels heat pumps exceeding building codes for insulation what is the EUI goal for the building? I think this one a little bit. Um, lead, lead silver actually encompasses a lot. Um, it's it's a lot of strategies. Um, Not just mechanically or insulation. Yeah, it, it, it's insulation. It's um, it's in indoor air quality. It's water. It's um, site, it's all kinds of things that, in, that are included in, in that. Um, so specifically, as Brian said, we are not planning to uh, provide solar panels on the project, but um, actually per code now, per the new updates to code, we're required to make the building solar ready, which means the building, the roof will be um, structurally able to handle the additional weight of solar panels, and then there'll be um, conduits that run from the roof down to the electric room so that you can install those at any point without having to tear the building apart to make it work. Um, currently, yes, we're thinking about heat pumps in diff different ways um, and exceeding the building codes for insulation, absolutely. Um, the EUI, that's um, for um, those who don't know, it's called the um, energy use intensity goal for the building. And that is still being, we're still trying to target that. Our engineers are just, like I said, we just started schematic design right now. So we're starting to drill down into these things right now and, and try to develop that, but it's often, um, it's often very low. So we're working on making this building. Um, what I like to say is that the envelope tends to be what we call net zero ready. Um, and and that's a very, very high efficient, no leaking. It, actually, Brian mentioned it earlier. We do tests on the envelope to infrared tests and other kinds of seal tests um, to make sure that there's no, not even any pinholes in places where the air can leak out. Um, and then um, because we're not providing the energy recovery like solar panels or um, like geothermal pumps, um, then it can't necessarily be net zero on site um, until those kind of things are added on, but those have a really high cost and um, there's other ways to procure those outside the project. So, um, so stay tuned for the EUI and um, stay tuned for the rest of those. I think, um, Brian, it's in um, two building committees from now where we're talking about some systems and energy systems. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, our next building committee meeting on um, the 14th, we're going to be uh, getting a little architectural update from you, Chris. And then the following one on May 4th, we're really going to drill down into mechanical systems. Um, people can see the target lead scorecard um, on the website. Um, you'll see the point system. It's a couple of points over silver um, right now, and it'll only continue to get better, like Chris said. We're in the really early stages um, of the design. So at Schematic, we're trying to figure out where things are going, nail down circulation. So we haven't really drilled down into the building. This next meeting though, on the 14th, we will start to talk about some of the um, design directions that Chris brought up, some of those pictures and how to achieve um, sort of the feeling of what we want inside and outside the school. So, but uh, the, this specific question, I think maybe um, planning to attend the May 4th building committee meeting might give you a little more insight on some of these specifics. All right. Okay, next question. Um, what is the latest status of Walpole High School? I thought this entire project started with an idea of a new high school. It appears that strategy has changed. Dr. Goff? I'm really glad somebody asked that question because I, I know that that still has us. So thank you, whoever that anonymous person was uh, to ask that. So um, yes, back in 2016, when we submitted the SOI, um, high school was on there and the MBA did not have an appetite for the high school. And yes, that, that was one of the um, original thoughts, if you can remember that 
for, for those of you that remember in 2016 was that um, we were gonna put the plan on putting a middle school at the high school and um, combine middle school and then we were gonna build a new high school. Well, it, it was not, um, it was denied at the, um, when we submitted our statement of interest in 2016, 2017, it was denied again. Um, they came out to visit and said, you know, th there's no chance, you know, for um, this at the high school. We also had our middle schools in there and we knew our middle schools were in um, really sad and, and rough shape. Um, so the third year, uh, also talking about changing the, um, to the more to focus on the middle schools, the MSBA came out and when they came out, uh, they, they saw uh, the, the parents in, in the state of our middle schools and that's how we were invited in. And Nancy, I know your hand is raised, maybe you wanna talk with, um, you know, when we had the 1.5 and, you know, what we're looking at doing for the high school. Sure. Um we at one point we knew that we wanted to do planning so we had gone to town meeting and we asked for 1.5 million to do the work that is currently um leading up to this middle school proposal at the time that we asked we weren't sure whether it was going to be a middle school proposal or a high school proposal but we knew that we had concerns about all of our secondary buildings um the, the most important thing that we felt we could do was to get MSBA support for a project because, um, you, you know, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars to help pay for this a project. So um, we went through the process saying we have concerns about three buildings. And they came back and said, um, you know, we have to look at everything all across the state and we don't prioritize your high school as a need at this point. Um, you know, that means we could apply for something down the road, but they also were pretty honest with us that it was not gonna be any time in the near future. So at, at the same time that we asked for the 1.5 million from town meeting, we also asked for $400,000 to do a study of Walpole High School um, and that money was approved. It's been put on hold because of COVID. And the thinking is we, we will probably hire a professional to see what we could do within existing town dollars to make, make the high school more, um, more modern. When it was renovated recent, well, it feels recent to me, but it wasn't. When it was renovated in 1999 and 2000, it was um, to add the proper amount of space. So uh, the, the sh I'm trying to make a long answer short, but the answer is we are looking at studying Walpole High School. There's no, there's no plan on, um, you know, undergoing any any of the process right now, but um, we we kind of went with where where we knew we could get support from the state, and that's for a middle school project. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, next question: Will property taxes only be affected until such time as the school is paid for, and then taxes will adjust accordingly? Yes, after um, we pay off the, it's a 30 years and then it comes off uh, the yearly tax bills. Yeah, I think similar to other projects in town it would eventually be expiring debt. Yeah, basically it's a mortgage and you know, we will eventually pay it off. Okay, the final question currently that we have in the Q&A are the architectural and mechanical systems meetings on 414 and 54 open to the public. Yes, yes. We, um, we do have them broadcast live on Walpole TV, so you can watch them um, and ask questions via the, um, you can ask questions via the um, 
email address, but there is really no way to kind of communicate live during the presentations. Unfortunately, um, typically they are. The building committee meetings typically are open to the public and anyone can attend. But um, during the time of COVID, essentially um, we're having meetings and they're viewable and anybody can um, send questions after and we try to address those questions. It's just not interactive, I should say. Okay. Um, well, do we have any? Yep, there, you may keep going. Sure. All right. Uh, without disclosing very much in this forum, um, how will all be protected in the new building? So maybe Chris or Brian or probably Chris can speak to design around safety. Yep. So um, safety and security is one of our top priorities of the building. Um, and uh, we have a dedicated specialist uh, security consultant that does this for um, schools all over New England, actually, and um, helps us calibrate each and every portion of the building so that it has the appropriate means of um, response. And those responses are carefully coordinated with the district's plans for um, any kind of um, incident, um, whether it's, you know, life safety or not. Um, and so we, we go through a very rigorous process on that and we meet with the first responders in, in Walpole um, and we go through um, bit by bit and make sure everything um, is accounted for there. So I, I think that's probably is about as much as say on that. Actually, I can actually tell you there's, there's this notion called SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And a lot of those envisioned character elements that I mentioned up at the front end of the um, presentation for the interior, a lot of those are the same strategies that you would use for that kind of system that not only enhance the safety of the building, but enhance the community feel of the building as well. So a lot of it comes hand in hand. Yeah, I'll add to that. I mean, there's, the, you know, passive security, as Chris has mentioned, there's a lot of things that go into the design and layout of the building from a security perspective, as well as the active security, as far as systems go, cameras or card access or things of that nature. So I think schools, if you haven't been in a modern school recently, um, and you can be blown away with the amount of systems that go into security and the amount of uh, design that goes in and um, the public safety departments will be intimately involved um, to what meets their needs as the first responder. So um, it is a it is a very critical piece of the, the design. Okay, would you consider power purchase agreements for solar panels at no charge of the town if the town requests them in the design? Is the south is the south facing roof space unobstructed? Um, I can. This may be a two part answer, but I'll start. Um, the the power purchase PPAs are typically taken on after a project is closed um, for. Um, various reasons we have um, we have worked with various environmental so every town has it seems like has their um, their you know version of Walpole Green or you know sustainable name of town um, and they're all looking for things like power purchase agreements and stuff like that the design team has no stance on power purchase agreements for solar that is going to be a town decision with the town manager and um, you know the folks up in that strata. Um, and like I said, we we are happy to coordinate and work with whoever comes along that may have an interest in doing that. Um, the south facing roof space, the, the entire building is really unobstructed except for what might be there for roof screens and mechanicals. Um, and so that's, I would say, uh, pretty much a yes for that. Um, and then the only other consideration, which Brian might be able to talk a little bit more about, is I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier when you get money back from various entities or partnerships that happen in coordination with an ongoing MSBA project before it's audited and closed, they may view that in a certain way and adjust your reimbursements. Um, and so 
that's why we typically see these PPAs happen after an audit or after the close of the MSBA's portion of the project. So, but Brian, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, it's part of it's part of the final audit process we talked about in the beginning, where they're constantly auditing um, what we submit to them during the project. At the end, they make you fill in any grants that you might have received in addition to the MSBA. So, if you're receiving rebates down from whatever on the project, you put all that into the final documentation, and they start to lower that amount uh, that they make their ultimate reimbursement from. Um, so a lot of towns do things after the project. Um, that being said, it, it really comes, as Chris mentioned, it really comes down to how the town wants to approach uh, things like solar. Natick, for instance, has a PPA agreement. They're putting the solar panels on, not as part of the project. We're helping coordinate that with the construction side of things. Um, but we built the building and then they're bringing in, um, they have a contract with a solar vendor. They have arrays going on the roof. They have a, a canopy in the parking lot. Again, not not through the construction other than the conduit infrastructure, uh, but coordinated with construction. And that was really in the town's, town's court. Great, thank you. Has the past year made you reflect on and adjust any of the original planning for the school? It, it has me. <laughs> about anybody else but um i think it's definitely had us all have a have a check on to make sure what we're doing is is right um i and at the same time you have to balance that with not having an overreaction and doing things that are not necessary um and um and i don't mean to belittle what we've all been through for the last 14 months but um I think that we have taken a hard, long, hard look at a lot of the things like ventilation and air systems, spacing of student desks, um, the ability to um, respond. Like we, for one project, we actually have gone back and talked about um, the red button scenario for building systems where, uh, you know, you can go in and push that one button and it changes all the systems over to pandemic mode, if you will. Um, and so planning for a pandemic has been on our minds, but surprisingly, I would say that the buildings that have, maybe not surprisingly, but um, newer buildings have less trouble with the pandemic response than all of these, most of the state's schools, which are all older um, and a lot of which don't have windows that work or can't open at all. Um, and those kind of things. And so what we're finding is that a lot of these newer buildings are actually fairly insulated to the pandemic problems that 80% of the rest of the state had. Um, I don't know if anybody has a different experience, but that's my. And I'll just add to that. I mean, one of the things that's a major consideration is that the technology backbone within the schools being able to support the video mm -hmm. education, not, not only within in each individual space, but having all those individual spaces on at the same time, um, having that ubiquitous technology throughout the buildings. Um, a lot of schools, as Chris mentioned, older schools that had a retrofit, you know, getting technology into those buildings and they just didn't have the capacity to support some of those things. So you know, that was already the trend in schools, but more so now than obviously it was a year ago. And I'll end with that our ed visioning sessions were all done during the pandemic. So you can be assured that our educational staff was incredibly reflective and in thinking a lot about what they were going through as they were visioning education for our students, um, which I think is important to note. We'll take the final question here. And this is actually a good question because it's a nice recap and maybe it can transition into us just reminding everyone where they can ask further questions and email the group. Um, but it asks, uh, how long would the construction of the new school take? And the question, the answer is approximately 24 months or two years. And what is the best estimate as to when the construction would start if everything gets done smoothly with the approval and the design process? And my understanding, Mr. Jarvis, is that would be December 2022. Yeah, it's it's that's a general timeline. Um, there are a couple options. Again, taking into consideration what we need to do to keep the existing school in operation. I mean, there's a possibility that we could do some work maybe that early summer. Um, there's ways to procure a contractor through CM at risk. Construction manager at risk allows us to bring in a contractor maybe a little bit earlier in the design phase and maybe start some pieces of construction earlier during the summer when the kids are gone, like setting up a temporary parking lot. So when those teachers come back, it's all ready for them. We can start construction. So 
in general, end of 22, construction is going to start in some form or fashion. Um, the new building will take approximately 18 to 24 months. Um, and then obviously we'd have to take down the existing bird and finish that site work uh, once the new building is operational. So um, 24, 30 months is probably a good duration all, all together, um, but that could you know, move a little bit here or there um, throughout the course of the project, but that's the general timeline. That's excellent. So we'll, uh, we, so now eight, almost 8.45, um, and I think we've taken a lot of fantastic questions tonight. Do, uh, Brian, do you wanna just review with everyone? Of course, there might be questions later on or, or, or they wanna contact for more specific information, who they can contact and how they can do that. Yeah, um, the web the website uh, on the schools on the schools uh, webpage um, is a great resource. It also has the uh, email address. I'm trying to figure if I can share it one last time. Um, if you have questions uh, regarding the project, I think it's middle school project uh, at the schools uh, at the schools uh, email address. Um, that's the best way to get a hold of us. Um, yeah, there you go. So middle school project at walpole.k12.ma.us. Uh, I think everyone on the project team gets those emails. So if you send those through, uh, we'll get that to the right person to get a, to get a response back to you. Um, check out the website. This presentation will be on there. All the previous presentations videos will be on there. Um, I think we also have a work plan on there, Tony, which says all the upcoming scheduled meetings for building committee. Um, if we're doing any school committee updates. Um, and that's that's basically it. And we will be doing a lot more community outreach, uh, obviously to target some, making sure we're getting a, a hold of as many residents as possible, uh, including some that you know might not have access to Zoom for whatever reason. Um, and then obviously after August, uh, MSBA's uh, final numbers from the MSBA leading up to town meeting, uh, there will be a lot of public forums. Hopefully they're back in person and they can be you know more intimate levels at different community groups or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, there will be a lot of opportunities uh, to learn more about the project. Thanks, Brian. I know for one, I'm looking forward to getting back to having some meetings in person. So I can't- I know, they're great. <laughs> they're much fun more interaction. All right. Well, thank you everybody for, for coming out. It was a great turnout and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you.